Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Lynn Fries, reporting from Paris. In this program, we look into the history of income and wealth from the 18th century. Who owns what and who earns what? For centuries, this has been a debate without much data, but that's changed with the publication of a new book. To discuss all this, the Real News visited Thomas Piketty in Paris. Thomas Piketty is professor of economics at the Paris School of Economics and the author of this new book, Capital in the 21st Century. Welcome, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you. So you've assembled a huge amount of data, and then you wrote a huge book about it. So tell us your objectives. Okay, so the objective of this book is really to provide the readers uh, with a lot of historical evidence on income and wealth. And, you know, this comes from a collective uh, uh, research project with, uh, has, has involved, uh, you know, over 20 uh, other scholars, uh, uh, including uh, Tony Atkinson, Emmanuel Saez, Facundo Alvaredo. And, and we've been collecting uh, over the past 15 years, uh, you know, the largest uh, existing uh, uh, historical database on income and wealth inequality. And the primary objective of this book is to put all this data in a, in a consistent manner so that everybody can access this documentation. And, uh, you know, I, I, I draw some conclusion about the future at, at the end of the book, but most of all, the, the book is really about the history of income and wealth so that, you know, uh, to help everybody to, to, to draw their own uh, conclusion. With three centuries of data, you're saying that the old world countries of Europe, Japan, are back to 19th century levels of, of wealth inequality. So tell us about that and why it matters for the entire world, and especially people born in 1970 or later. Well, I guess, uh, you know, I have, I have a particularly some sympathy for people born in the 1970s. And, and for them, you know, wealth uh, uh, is going to have a different structure than for the baby boom court. And namely, uh, you know, we see in recent decades a return of the relative importance uh, of wealth uh, as compared to income, which we didn't have, uh, you know, for the baby boom court. And the reason is that, you know, until World War I, uh, we, we lived in, in societies that I call in the book, you know, patrimonial societies, where the total quantity of wealth was very large with respect to income. So typically, the ratio of total wealth to income was about six to seven years. Then this dropped tremendously to about two, three years in the 1950s. And this has been uh, going uh, upward again, you know, particularly in European countries and in Japan, back to five, six years of national income uh, today. And what this means is that, uh, uh, you know, for the post-war uh, baby boom court, you know, there was relatively little to inherit uh, from, from the past. This was because of the destruction, the inflation and taxation due to the financing of the war, which reduced the quantity of private wealth uh, that was to be uh, transmitted in the 50s, 60s. Uh, now we are back to um, uh, a relative importance of wealth uh, that is going in the direction of, of pre-World War I societies with lower concentration of wealth, you know, it's important to emphasize that today there is a middle class in wealth that did not exist one century ago. So having a lot of wealth per se is certainly not bad. You know, if you have a, a middle class and if you have, a, a, you know, equal sharing or at least, uh, you know, spreading of wealth, then, you know, it's better to have more wealth uh, than, than to have only uh, debt. So uh, it's all a matter of, you know, whether we manage to make uh, the middle class uh, in wealth uh, expand uh, rather than, than uh, uh, shrinking, which is what we've had, unfortunately, in the, in the recent decades. So let's talk now about income inequality in, in the new world, the United States. An important study was done in U.S. income inequality by Simon Kuznets in the 20th century. Tell us about his work and put it in historic context. Okay, so in, in, in the 1950s, uh, Kuznets was the first economist to produce the uh, income inequality series, and what he found was a decline in income inequality in the United States between 1913 and 1948. Now, in fact, this was largely due to the Great Depression, to World War II, wage compression during World War II, uh, taxation policy uh, that was enacted uh, after the Great Depression. And, and Kuznets himself was very much aware of that. But people in the 50s and 60s, in the Cold War and, and, and colonial, post-colonial context, you know, wanted to believe in a, in a happy story and a happy end about uh, inequality uh, under capitalism. And uh, Kuznets somehow proposed such a story by saying, okay, maybe 
you know, maybe there are universal and natural reasons why inequality could, uh, uh, you know, reduce uh, in, in, the, in the advanced stages of economic development. Uh, you know, himself was not really convinced about it, and indeed what we've seen uh, since then is a return of very large inequality of income uh, in, in the United States. And uh, uh, I guess what, what's new in, in this book is that we are able to extend the work of Kuznets to many more countries and to much longer time period and this allows us to realize that you know this optimistic belief in the Kuznets curve in the 1950s, 60s, 70s was really due to, to in fact to very special uh, circumstances. And other optimistic beliefs? You said that the golden age post-war meritocratic societies were built on transitory illusions. Tell us about that. I think in the 50s, 60s, 70s, we sort of uh, invented a number of uh, fairy tales or nice uh, stories as to why, uh, you know, the, the world is now different. Uh, inequality has nothing to do with, uh, you know, 19th century inequality. Now, the two main uh, illusions, I think, are the human capital illusion and the war of ages uh, illusion. And I, I should say that as all good illusions, they are partly true, but they are just much less true than what people have believed and what a number of people still believe. So the human capital illusion is saying that, you know, now with the modern economy, uh, all what matters is human capital and education, personal skills, personal talent, as opposed to traditional uh, forms of non-human capital, financial, uh, real estate, uh, etc. Now, this is an illusion because, in fact, in the long run, uh, you have a rise of both human and non-human capital in comparable proportions. So, of course, you have a rise of human capital. You have more, uh, you know, education and, and human higher level of human skills today. But you also have higher level of uh, real estate, uh, equipment, uh, patents, uh, robots, and, and other non-human assets. So that, you know, in the long run, you know, I'm not saying that, that robots will dominate uh, humans, but I'm just saying that the balance between uh, human capital and non-human capital has no reason to move in the direction of human labor. And indeed, if we look at the recent trends, uh, you know, the capital share in GDP has actually been going up and the labor share, so the share of income going to uh, labor earners in the form of wages or other forms of, of compensations for labor uh, has actually uh, been reduced. And, you know, I'm not saying it's going to reduce forever, but it can very well stabilize uh, at a level that is not so different from the 19th century. So in other words, the capital labor split today is not that different from the 19th century, and it would be wrong to assume, and this has been an illusion, to assume that the, the technological change alone, and te you know, modernity alone, in the form of technical change, would uh, make uh, you know, the triumph of labor over capital and the triumph of, of human capital. So this is the first illusion. The second illusion is different. The War of Ages illusion uh, relies on the idea that with aging and with the increase in life expectancy, the whole nature of capital accumulation has changed entirely and now it's mostly life cycle accumulation. So you accumulate for your old days and then when you're old you consume some of your capital. So you still have a lot of capital but it's not really inequality because it's just, you know, everybody is going to be young and then old and so, you know, there's no problem. It's just a way, capital is just a way of shifting purchasing power later in life. Now, unfortunately, this is, this is largely an, an, an illusion in the sense that, you know, the share of wealth accumulation that has to do with, uh, with uh, uh, pension uh, you know, it has certainly not uh, become 100%. It has not even become 50%. It has not become, you know, less than 20% of total wealth accumulation in every country. And even in the countries where, where uh, uh, you know, this life cycle wealth accumulation, including pension funds, is up to 20 or 25%, you know, the concentration of this wealth within age group is, is quite large. And overall, if you take the 100% of wealth accumulation, uh, what we observe in the data is that inequality of wealth within each age group, so within people with the same age, 40 to 49, 50 to 59, 30 to 39, 70s, etc., is actually almost as large as the total inequality of wealth over the entire population. So this is really an illusion to imagine that, you know, because people live longer, uh, the uh, you know uh, inequality of wealth has completely uh, uh, changed, and the, the very nature of, of capital. So, 
I, I think it's really time to reopen, you know, these debates. You know, some of these illusions could have been right, and to some extent, you know, they, they had some element of truth in them. But it's important to, you know, put them under uh, examination, to 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 look at them in a very careful way, and and I think to conclude that, you know, they are partly illusion. To sum up the ground covered so far, talk specifically about these two distinct patterns you find in your study, one for income, the other for wealth, and then get into what all this means for the 21st century. The, the main um, uh, evolutions that I study in the book are two uh, important uh, U-shaped patterns. One is for the share uh, of total income uh, going to the top income earners, and we've seen uh, you know, uh, the reduction of uh, this share uh, during the, the war period and then a large increase, particularly in the United States uh, since the 1970s. And this is largely due to the rise of top managerial compensation uh, in the US. Now, the other U-shaped pattern, which in my view is even more important in the long run, uh, is the, the evolution of the total quantity of wealth with respect to income. And what we've seen, uh, particularly in European countries and in Japan, is that the, the total quantity of wealth was very large up until World War I, around six, seven years of income. It dropped to two, three years of income in the 1950s. And then it has been increasing since then, and it is now back to uh, uh, levels that are almost as large as prior to World War I, which is not necessarily bad in itself if you know, people have equal share in this large stock of wealth. Now, the problem is that in practice, uh, you know, the inequality of wealth tends to be uh, much larger than the inequality of labor income. So this return of wealth also uh, uh, implies, uh, to some extent, a return of inequality. But, you know, we can do better. We can try to have, uh, of course, this still this large quantity of wealth, but with a more equal distribution and, and, and higher wealth mobility and higher access to wealth uh, for people who start with, uh, with low income. Before getting into how we can do better, talk about what would be reasonable to expect if instead capitalism were just left to itself. Of these two patterns, you say that even if we get income inequality, get wage inequality under control, what most concerns you is wealth inequality. If we don't get that under control, we're headed to levels of uh, like in the 19th century or worse. So talk to us about the dynamics of, of the future accumulation of wealth and what's behind it? What's pushing us in that direction? I think the, the main force uh, that, that can push in the long run toward very high concentration of wealth is the tendency for the rate of return to capital to be higher than the growth rate, uh, which I not are bigger than G uh, in my book, and which, you know, until the 19th century and, and until World War I, this was pretty obvious to everybody that R was bigger than G. You know, people will not formulate it this way, but in fact, this was obvious because the growth rate was very small. Certainly, in agrarian societies, the growth rate was close to 0%. And then, in, with the Industrial Revolution, it increased up to 1, 1.5%, but with a rate of return to capital of at least 4 to 5%, and sometimes even more for more risky assets, then the gap between the rate of return and the growth rate was very large indeed uh, up until World War I. And uh, what historical uh, investigation suggests is that this was the primary explanation for the very large concentration of wealth. And so in spite of the fact that there's been a complete change in the nature of wealth between the 18th century and 1910, you know, in 1910, uh, land does not really matter anymore. It's only in Downton Abbey that you have a lot of land. But, you know, in the real world, uh, land was less than 5% of national wealth in the UK or in France in 1910. But the concentration of wealth, although wealth took new forms, financial assets, international investment, industrial capital, real estate, the concentration of this wealth was as large or even a bit larger than the concentration of land in the 18th century. And the primary explanation for this, uh, according to my investigation, is this tendency of rate of return to be bigger than the growth rate. And there is a serious possibility that we'll be back with this tendency in the future, uh, primarily because um, uh, the growth rate in the future, in particular the population growth rate, is apparently going to decline, you know, according to demographic projections. And also uh, uh, the productivity growth rate uh, you know, which was very large in the post-war period, uh, 
50s, 60s, 70s, uh, uh, as some countries were catching up from the from the war destruction uh, and and the growth rate that were four five percent, you know, in Europe, in Japan during that time, you know, are now uh, for the past 30 years they have been down to one 1.5 percent in, in productivity growth uh, terms, and you know it could well be that this is the kind uh, of growth rate that we have in the future, uh, in which case. Uh, uh, the rate of return to capital, especially given you know international competition and increased bargaining power for for capital owners, uh, uh, the gap between the rate of return to capital and the growth rate will be high again in the future. And and you know it, the, the, during the 20th century there were a number of unusual circumstances that changed entirely this equilibrium between R and G, a big decline in R in the rate of return due to the uh, destruction, inflation, taxation, a big increase in G, the growth rate in the post-war period because of the recovery, and also because of the large population growth. You know, it's important to have in mind that half of total GDP growth during the 20th century was actually the growth of population, and, and this apparently uh, is now over. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not saying I am able to predict the future value of growth rate and rates of return. You know, there are many different processes uh, social, demographic, economic, political, financial that are going on. What I'm saying is that we sh it would be a mistake just to uh, rely on natural forces for you know, the rate of return and the growth rate to, to equilibrate each other. You know, there's no reason, there's no logical reason, there's no historical reason why uh, you know, growth rate uh, should be as large as the rate of return. So you know, it could be that you know, the growth rates are suddenly going to be 4 or 5 percent per year in the future. You know, it could be that we all have a lot of children and we all make a lot of invention each year so that the growth rate is 4 or 5 percent. And you know, maybe one day we'll discover a planet where the growth rate is 10 percent uh, forever. But you know, I think it would be a mistake to bet on that. And I think we should have a, another plan you know, in case this incredible coincidence uh, uh, with a growth rate as large as the rate of return uh, happens, you know, in case this does not happen, and in case the growth rate is closer to 1 to 2 percent in the long run, then uh, we should have a, another plan, and we should try to set up uh, institutions, uh, fiscal institutions, educational institutions, that allow us to, uh, to spread the wealth, and that allow us to have a balanced distribution of income and wealth uh, in the long run. So you put three centuries of data into the public domain, so now everybody has access to the history of income and wealth and can draw their own conclusions. But what are your conclusions? What are the lessons so today democratizing wealth can be less violent and more durable? I think you know, one of the main lessons of the, of the 20th century is that indeed wars and, and big shocks played a large role in the reduction in inequality and that you know, we, we ought to do better for the future, and actually we can do better. You know, there are uh, much more pacific ways, of course, to redistribute wealth, but we need to, to think harder about it. So we need to rethink entirely the issue of progressive taxation. You know, progressive taxation of income of in, and of inheritance was invented in the 20th century, but somehow at the end of the 20th century it was abandoned, I think largely for bad reason. So we need to rethink that again. And also we need to uh, 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 analyze new forms of, of progressive taxation, in particular uh, progressive taxation of wealth. Uh, I think you know, it's important to realize that wealth is going to be increasingly important as compared to income in the 21st century. Therefore, the taxation of wealth is going to be more and more important as compared to the taxation of income. We need both, of course, but we need to rethink the taxation of wealth. Uh, in most developed countries, the way we tax wealth right now is through um, uh, property taxes. So, for instance, you know, in, in the US or in most European countries, you tax real estate property uh, uh, just in proportion to their value, so it's not progressive. And also, because these property taxes were set up in the 19th century, uh, they do not really take into account uh, financial assets or financial liabilities. So I think it will be important to adapt them to the structure of wealth in the 21st century, and it will be uh, adequate to transform these property taxes into uh, progressive taxation of net wealth.
So for instance, you know, if you have a, a house worth $500,000 uh, and you have a, a mortgage of $490,000, you know, your net wealth is only $10,000. You know, you are not rich in, in any way. So uh, in the current property tax system, you actually pay as much property tax uh, as someone without a mortgage. And, and sometimes, you know, you even have people whose property value is below their mortgage and they keep paying the same property tax. So I think this is just not a right way to tax wealth and, and, and uh, both to uh, allow people to access wealth, to accumulate wealth and also to limit the concentration of wealth at the top end of the distribution. We need to have a progressive tax on net wealth where you would have a much lower rate for you know, people who are trying to access wealth for the, say, the bottom 90% of the population and uh, graduated increasing rates for people who already have uh, millions of billions of wealth. And, and the objective is not to, to tax more wealth overall, it's actually to keep the same quantity of wealth but to spread it more and to increase the mobility uh, of wealth in, in society. And so why is transparency so integral to your policy recommendations for taxing wealth? To me, uh, transparency in wealth uh, is really the, the key objective because I think it's very difficult to have, uh, you know, a, a serious democratic debate and, and, uh, and a rational democratic debate with so little uh, hard information on wealth dynamics and with so little public knowledge on who owns what where. And I think to me, the primary objective of taxation is actually to produce more transparency. And it's important to realize that historically, uh, taxation has always been more than taxation. It's also a way to produce legal categories to produce uh, democratic accountability. So for instance, when there, when there was no corporate income tax, you know, there was no corporate account. You could not even know what the profits of a company were. So it's not that today's accounts are always perfectly transparent, but at least they exist. And it will be the same for wealth. You know, I think if we, in order to have a proper wealth tax, we will need more uh, a serious fight against tax haven, more automatic transmission of information uh, uh, from banks uh, to each country's government uh, so, as, so that we know who owns what where. Uh, we will need to go uh, toward the global registry of financial assets so that uh, we have a much better knowledge of cross-border cross assets than we have now. And, and then, you know, we'll see, you know, with this transparency, our democratic institution will be better able to decide, you know, which tax rate should be uh, adopted. And, you know, I don't pretend that I have, you know, a perfect mathematical formula to choose the tax rate. I'm just saying, you know, if the top of the wealth distribution uh, is rising three times as fast as the size of the economy, which is what, uh, the, you know, the data we have on wealth tends to indicate. So, for instance, all the Forbes ranking data sh suggests that the top of the wealth distribution uh, is rising at 6-7% per year not only in the US but also in Europe and also at the world level, whereas average wealth at the world level is rising at only at 2% per year. You know, if the top is rising three times as fast as the average, then you know you cannot say that a 1% tax rate or a 2% tax rate at the very top is going to kill the economy. You know, this is not serious. Now, if the data shows differently, you know, maybe one day when we have better transparency on wealth, we will see that the top wealth group actually do not rise faster than the average, then they will not need to have, uh, you know, a steeply progressive taxation. So, you know, we can adapt our policy to uh, what we see. And, you know, I think this is what democracy is all about. You know, we need information, we need transparency in order to have, a, you know, a, a serious uh, democratic debate on the, on the basis of, you know, good information. Talk more about the structure of capital in the 21st century in this rethink about wealth tax. The 21st uh, century is, is characterized by uh, a similar kind of patrimonial structure as the 19th century, but with different types of assets and different types of wealth. So the kind of property taxation system that was set up in the 19th century is not enough for the 21st century. First, because it was not progressive, you know, it was proportional because this was, you know, the societies uh, that were actually based on, on very large inequality of wealth and, and you know, sometimes uh, they were not even uh, using universal suffrage and, you know, this was really a different uh, approach to, to, to progressivity. And also this property tax 
of the 19th century uh, were not taking into account financial assets, financial liabilities, which are so important today. So today, a big part of the wealth, of course, is financial and, and involves uh, international financial assets. So this is why, uh, you know, we need to rethink the taxation of wealth in this high financial wealth world. And this requires uh, international cooperation. Now, you know, the U.S. is one quarter of world GDP. The European Union is another quarter of world GDP. China will soon be uh, about almost one quarter of world GDP. And, you know, each of these area, uh, you know, has problems with rising concentration of wealth. So, so far, uh, China or Russia, for that matter, are sort of treating, uh, you know, their wealthy oligarchs on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis, which uh, I think they are starting to realize, particularly in China, that they ought to do it in a, in a better way, and that property taxation, taxation of wealth, you know, is already uh, being seriously debated in China, and, you know, it could be that they make progress uh, faster than, than Europe or the United States, you know, we will see. Uh, but all, you know, the areas of the world will have to, have to try to adapt their view of taxation and their their consideration for wealth tax uh, to uh, you know a world of very high wealth to income ratio and and very large cross border assets and and uh, financial wealth and why do you find there's so much to learn about capitalism in the 21st century from your study of the period before the first world war there's a lot to learn from from the study of 1900-1910. Uh, you know, not because we are going to go for another uh, World War One, but because this was a time uh, where you had, at the same time, a lot of innovation going on, and at the same time, a lot of inequality. You know, very high concentration of wealth, and you know, it's important to realize that uh, um, uh, the two can can go together because even when you have a lot of innovation, you know, the growth rate is not sufficiently large to compensate for the rate of return and to uh, undo this very large uh, uh, concentration of wealth. And, you know, some people, um, uh, I've read some reviews where people, you know, saying, uh, well, you know, we don't care about the past, uh, the future will be different, we will have a lot of innovation, uh, you know, growth rate will be 4 or 5 percent per year. You know, I, I think uh, 1900, 1910, uh, you know, these are not agrarian economies. You know, these are, uh, this is the time where we actually invent uh, the automobile, uh, the electricity, the radio. Uh, so, you know, maybe this is less important than Facebook, but still, uh, you know, these are important innovations. And, you know, I think it would be wrong to, to imagine that there's nothing to learn from the studying this time period. So there were a lot of innovation, but still the growth rate uh, was 1, 1.5% 1 per year. And this was not sufficient to spread the wealth as compared to the, you know, the forces going in the, in the direction of a very large uh, concentration of wealth, so large uh, that, you know, the, this was a, a threat for the, for the proper working of uh, our democratic institution, and it could again be so uh, in the future. And your concluding thoughts? You know, the, the concluding thought of my, of my story is that, uh, you know, technological uh, rationality uh, does not lead to uh, democratic rationality. So, you know, the market and, and, and private property should be the slave of democracy uh, rather than the opposite. So we want to use the market system, the price system, the private property system, uh, so as to, to, uh, to, to make sure that everybody will benefit from uh, prosperity, will benefit from income and wealth. But for this to happen, we need very strong uh, democratic institutions, very strong fiscal institutions, very strong uh, and inclusive uh, education system. You know, that's not going to happen just by relying on uh, technological forces and market forces. So we, we really, uh, the, the lessons of history are very important for that. For a long time, uh, you know, the agenda uh, was set uh, by a number of people arguing that, you know, all we need is market competition or, you know, the book by Milton Friedman uh, in the 1960s argued that, uh, you know, all what we need basically is a good federal reserve. You know, we don't need a welfare state. We don't need progressive taxation. With a good federal reserve, that's enough. I think to a large extent, we still live in this legacy today. We still believe that, you know, uh, since 2008, basically, that creative monetary policy and a good action by central bank is going to be enough. That's not going to be enough. You know, we need a good central bank. We need a good federal reserve. But that's not enough. We also need 
progressive taxation, we also need welfare state, we need education, we need new forms of progressive taxation. Uh, you know, I think we've been asking too much to creative monetary policy in the past five years. You know, that's not going to solve all of our problems. And sometimes this is creating bubbles, this is creating, you know, huge profits for certain people and huge loss for others. And, you know, taxation is more complicated than, than uh, crea money creation because you need a parliament to vote for the tax base. You need to enforce the tax law. That's more complicated. But at least we know who pays what. Whereas when you create billions of dollars or billions of euros every day, you know, sometimes you don't know what you're doing with them. And, uh, uh, you know, we need to rethink these institutions and what they have brought us in the past and what we need for the future uh, in, a, in a new light. Thomas Piketty, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.